Um, and my other duty um, is to introduce to you the reason this room quickly became oversold um, when the program was announced, uh, Anne Mulcahy. Um, now, Anne could talk about almost any subject having to do with Fortune 500 corporations and their equivalent in the nonprofit world and the role of women within these organizations. But she has also played in about every boardroom role there is. I'm going to interrupt you myself to tell you that um, uh, she, she's no longer on the board of Catalyst. She was on the city group board, but is not now. It, we don't say that. Instead, her boards are Target, Washington Post, and Johnson and & Johnson, and she's head of Save the Children. She was actually captured. I know many of you wonder how this happens. But she was captured by the super board sleuths at Target when she was just a marketing executive. Uh, she'll tell you a little bit about that, I hope. And that was well before she became Xerox's CEO in 2000, stepping down into the top of a company that hordes of people thought was headed for bankruptcy. Fortune itself made Xerox a prominent example in a 2001 story, Why Companies Fail, and it was soon after that that Anne's name turned up for the first of many times in Fortune when she reacted to that story by sending Fortune a protesting letter, <laughs> which we printed. It, it said we were premature grave diggers and we should just wait and watch Xerox succeed. <laughs> which, of course, it did under her leadership as she became what Fortune in a big complimentary profile, I call these all the wonder of them pro profiles as opposed to all the pity of them, um, <laughs> in a big complimentary profile of her two years later called the accidental CEO. As CEO and chairman of Xerox, she had the experience of leading a board, of asking one prominent Xerox board member to resign, she'll tell you about that, and of becoming an executive that other corporations very much wanted on their board. She's seen her share of boards needing to handle trouble, Citigroup, the Washington Post with the student loan issue, J&J &J with its problems in the last year and a half. Did I mention? I did mention it. And now she stepped out of Xerox to head Save the Children, where she's picked up the additional experience of heading a very prominent nonprofit board. And I know that there are many here of you who are from the nonprofit world, and there are, you know, there are lawyers here who I'm sure are worried about, their, uh, about whatever boards they have in their law firms. Uh, so she's obviously a natural for this session called Boards, Lessons and Best Practices to Build a Great Board. Anne's going to take off from here in the direction she thinks best and impart a lot of key thoughts as we get this program started. Then she'll be hoping you have questions and comments having to do with your lessons and best practices learned, telling us when you can, I know some of these things are sensitive, about your first person experiences. And so, Anne will okay. Thank you so much, Carol, and uh, I'm thrilled to be on stage with you. This is uh, a treat. And it's, it's actually nice to be back. I haven't been here for a few years, and um, it's lovely to see so many people that I enjoy um, spending time with. I was wondering why they asked me to do this session, because there are lots of women who have lots of board experience. We just heard Maggie Wilderotter had 23 public boards, so obviously that would be tough to be. But then I realized I probably have a more diversity of experience in terms of the good, the bad, and the ugly in terms of uh, board experiences through the years that might be more informative than just a smooth sailing kind of uh, experience. And so I've actually never at one time, but I've been on six public company boards. Um, I've been on three nonprofit boards, um, um, but particularly now, near and dear to my heart, I chair, chair the board of uh, Save the Children. Um, and I've also been on a privately held international um, board as well. So, um, and I would have to say that um, sometimes I did not choose wisely, <laughs> and um, you wind up uh, kind of learning how important it is on both sides, not just to when you are in a position to make a decision about being on a board, equally important as you staff and work with your board to staff your own board. Uh, they are tough mistakes to rectify, and uh, that's something that I, I learned the hard way. So um, I'll begin and talk
talk for a few minutes just about some observations and hopefully provoke some thinking in the room so that you then, um, it'll be much more interesting when you're participating, but I, I think my first lesson learned was to do your homework. And I actually don't mean reading um, 10Ks and, and business information because the really important part of doing your homework is understanding the caliber of the CEO and the management team. Um, because at the end of the day, um, you are placing your bets and your trust in a management team and a culture that actually will be the most vital and important thing about how you can contribute, how you're valued on a board, and what kind of um, culture that board creates as well. And, um, and, and I have to say that no amount of smarts or capabilities or skills makes you invulnerable on a board. <laughs> it is um, when you are in a situation that's complex and ugly, um, it totally depends on the transparency and the value system of the management team. You will never do enough due diligence to discover or find all of the issues or concerns that lie in the, somewhere in the network of a big company. So that ability to kind of choose wisely with regard to the value system of the management team that you're gonna be supporting as a board member, I think is something that I learned. It's not about the prestige of the company, how big the company is, what a great business it is. Um, do your homework in terms of the caliber of the, the um, management team. Also, do a little homework on your fellow directors, because um, that makes for either a productive or, quite frankly, a very disappointing experience. And um, that's something that um, I've, I've learned, to kind of take the time and say, I'd really like to talk to a few of your directors before um, I sign up, um, just to get a sense of how it runs. Is this um, a board that operates in a way that's consistent with how I would feel I can make an impact um, in a company. And um, I think, you know, is it a club that I want to be a member of? Um, and sometimes, particularly I think when you're entertaining your first board, that desire to jump in and take that board experience can really be a barrier for future board experiences if not thought through wisely. So I thought Warren's a very interesting thing this morning that um, you asked him whether he um, looked, how he felt about looking for a woman. Did it make a difference? And he said, absolutely not. You know, 50% of the talent base, I'm going after talent. Um, my second lesson learned is that don't join a board that is looking for a woman. <laughs> Sign of things to come. If they are not smart enough to figure out a conversation with you about what you uniquely bring to that board, really bad sign. <laughs> And I can assure you that will be exactly how you get treated on that board as a woman director. And um, so my new rule is I will not join a board that doesn't already have 25% women directors. And um, just to kind of set the stage for a higher expectation, I mean, there's a whole list, I don't know if Eileen Lang's here, but there's a whole list of boards that have no women, and man, I just say blacklist those suckers and uh, don't go on them because this is 2011 and they've had the time and um, I think, you know, it's significant that there's no women directors on those boards. Um, the other piece of it, and I know we talk about it all the time, but um, working hard when you're on a board and not get, getting overloaded um, so that you show up and it's kind of a superficial experience is really critical. Um, you know, I have absolutely, and I didn't at Xerox and I don't on any boards, I have zero tolerance for people that don't come completely prepared, where they've done their homework, they know um, what the agenda looks like and they're participating. And I think for those of us who have companies, um, we ought to hold very high standards in terms of the amount of preparation that our board members do and we ought to call them out when they don't and maybe take them aside the first time, but um, it is unacceptable 
um, for board members that actually don't do their homework, aren't fully prepared when they come to a board, and that aren't learning all the time about the business in whatever ways um, are appropriate. I know at Save the Children now, which is interesting for a nonprofit because it used to be, you know, the way you got on a nonprofit board is if you wrote a check, you were on the board. And now for every board member, it's expectations of attendance, same as a public board. It's expectations of contribution. Uh, we expect you to be a material giver to that um, cause. And the third thing is, is we expect you to take trips and visit our programs so that you actually understand and see what we do. And if that's not acceptable, then we'll go find someone else. And I think we have to have very high standards when we think about people joining um, boards. The other thing is, is, and I think boards are great learning opportunities. There's no question about it. But I've also learned you don't want to go too far from your wheelhouse. <laughs> that it is important to actually have some sense of the business model, to bring a set of skills that somehow are relevant um, to the business. And that doesn't mean you have to stay in an industry or, but I do think that you have to have a really good accurate assessment of what you bring to the table. And don't get so far outside it that it's really difficult for you to make an impact and actually you know, be a valued contributor um, on that board. So the best board experiences I, I've had um, are the ones that, where there's chemistry and respect among the CEO and the board members. And it's kind of gotten a bad name. It almost sounds like if boards get along that they're in the CEO's back pocket. And I think that's really a shame <laughs> because good chemistry on a board I think is hugely important. We don't pay a lot of time thinking about it, but um, you know, boards are a team. And I think as a team, their contribution is incredibly enhanced if they know each other, they respect each other, and that's not about having you know, same views or agreeing on things, but they actually get to debate in respectful ways and to you know, put diverse opinions on the table without disenfranchising or alienating people, including the management team, which I th I've seen happen on boards, and I think it's a really unfortunate outcome that, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, about board members that feel that the way they demonstrate their contribution is by showing how <coughs> smart they are. And always having, and for those of us that sit on boards, I think we know who they are. <laughs> they always have to say something. And, you know, they disagree sometimes for the sake of disagreeing to show that they're not just rubber stamping. And I have to tell you, it's really irritating as a CEO. Um, and I kind of put them in the category of there's board members who um, really create value and then there's board members that create work. And um, those that just you know, cannot differentiate between when there's really a meaningful time for a contribution and having to hear themselves heard are definitely um, in the create work category. Um, and I think something that's become really important lately is this boundary between knowing the responsibilities of being on a board <laughs> and what management does. And, um, you know, I, I, I take it as one of my charters <laughs> in all the boards that I'm on is to kind of um, hold people accountable for when they get into the weeds and they're in management's territory. Um, sometimes that's hard for a CEO to say without, you know, appearing to, you know, be disrespectful to the board member. It's easier, easier for another board member to say, I'm just not sure that that's our job. And um, I think it's really important that we kind of hold each other accountable on boards um, for recognizing and respecting the line of where the board member contribution is and when kind of you're interfering uh, with management. You know, board members get tested at the worst possible times. It's really easy to be a board member when things are going smoothly, I have to say. It's, um, you know, but it is during a crisis period of time that board members really undergo, I think, the acid test of what kind of contributor they are. And, um, you know, one of the things that when I first became CEO of Xerox, within six months, three board members resigned. And um, it was kind of uh, a, a huge statement. It was right when you had to 
you know, publicly disclosed board member resignation, so it wasn't exactly an act of faith that we had uh, people kind of jumping ship off the board. And, and, and Carol, it would be interesting to hear your views on this, but I, I see article after article written disparaging the board members that stay on troubled companies and, you know, how dare they, they got the place into trouble. And my view is, this is the time where they got to roll up their sleeves and get the damn companies out of trouble. And that's when board members should actually take responsibility. It's a reputational impact, obviously, being on a, a, a troubled company's board. But they know the place. They've been collecting checks for years. This is the time. It's payback time. This is when you need board members that actually have courage and are not about what does it mean to me to be a member of a Xerox board that was going through an SEC investigation. And, you know, quick story, we had three board members who jumped ship and left. And we had some stellar board members that stayed that should have been the ones that were more worried about their reputation. But I'll, I'll mention a couple. And one of them was Ralph Larson on the Johnson & Johnson board who stayed and was battered um, during that period of time, but rolled up his sleeves and felt this huge accountability to actually help solve some of the problems that had happened during the ten his tenure on the board. The other one was John Pepper at P&J. John Pepper probably had the most stellar reputation of any CEO in corporate America, along with Ralph Larson. And when I was having to go down and visit the SEC, this would have been the Criminal Enforcement Division. Um, John Pepper came with me um, each and every time, four different times, to visit with the head of enforcement to try to settle the, uh, the SEC uh, you know, suit that, that Xerox was undergoing. And you know, at the time, I'm not sure I even appreciated what an extraordinary risk it was for him, what courage it showed. Um, but those are the kind of board members you want. You want the people that step out in times of trouble and actually feel this tremendous sense of accountability to put some skin in the game and, uh, and get companies back into shape. And uh, for those that write about you know, board members stepping down, and I lived through this actually at Citigroup where the board was you know, basically told, that the chairman of the board was told to turn over um, a minimum of 60% of the board within three months to get, you know, to indicate that, you know, the board had failed and we wanted now financial experts on the board. And I can assure you that they did Citigroup no favors um, with that particular uh, action. So, um, yeah, I think your metal gets tested during times of stress and it really demonstrates that the number one quality I look for um, in board members is courage and sometimes short uh, in supply. Um, I also think that you know, one of the things that we have to think about on our boards is you know, how much time we spend on compliance and governance versus strategy and operations and challenge and hold uh, our companies accountable for really ensuring that we are not over-responding um, to what I call the compliance environment or the risk management environment, which has become synonymous with not taking risks versus taking risks. So um, I think we all have to play that role of really challenging um, these companies to make sure that we're really talking about the things that matter um, and make a difference. Um, you know when you see it, when you see a great board. And um, I do want to spend a minute on Target. I love all the boards I'm on right now. and. I'm at various stages of knowing them, but I've been on the Target board for 13 years. Um, they've never used a search company to find a director. And no offense taken to my director colleagues out there, but they do their homework and they actually go out because they don't want a lot of the usual suspects. And I think search firms are doing a much better job now, but years ago it was the big names, it was the cycling of the same usual suspects for boards. But they went out and they did their homework and they looked at companies and they went a level below, and if they had to, they went a level below that to find you know, diversity with content and picked great people and they took chances. And they brought me on to the board um, before I was the CEO of Xerox. And I have to say, it was one of these great boards. Um, another thing to watch out for in boards is what I call kind of the the two-tiered structure of boards, you know, the haves and the have-nots, and um, 
This board um, looked for contribution and listened and really helped, the board helped make some extraordinarily strategic decisions um, at the time about divesting the department store business, which was thriving and doing great. The name was, of the company was Dayton Hudson at the time, and we made the decision to actually place our bets on Target, which was still kind of a flailing, unknown discount retailer, and um, you know, made a very bold decision to focus on their core competence um, and changed the name of the company to Target and divested uh, the other divisions of the company. And they have had, um, I think, one of the most um, productive and engaging boards I've ever been a part of. And it's not a bunch of CEOs or retired CEOs. As a matter of fact, they would be the minority of the people on the Target board. Um, it is an incredibly diverse set of perspectives across the board, but they do their homework and they bring people onto that board that they think have courage, <laughs> have skill sets that they think can make a contribution, and they take their responsibility to their consumer base really seriously. Long before it was in vogue, their primary consumer were women, and they had 60% women directors before they had to, and I think I challenge any retailer to, um, to really look and, and say that they got that as early on as Target. Um, and, you know, even in, and this is during tough times, um, you know, and Target just came through a difficult period of time where during the recession, um, price was everything. Walmart started to come up uh, the curve again from a price perspective and, um, you know, uh, Target kind of shabby chic was not looking quite as good as it was uh, perhaps in 2007. And we had um, literally a day's discussion on it and said, this is a company that has to stick to its knitting. Its whole deal is differentiation. And um, the whole thing has been not trying to look like someone else. And they stayed the course, and I'm convinced that it has served them well. But they take, I think, the most important and strategic issues, and they actually work them. They lead the discussion. They have strong views. But um, it is probably the most satisfying um, board I've ever been involved in. They also had great succession planning. So I've been through two CEOs, and I happen to think great succession planning doesn't happen very often. And um, we went seamlessly from a great 10-year CEO to a developed internal candidate who's world-class and who is leading Target today. So I'm going to switch just for a minute, talk a little bit about nonprofit boards, and, um, and then I'd love to hear what's on your mind. Um, so, not that different. And I think it's really important that we don't think about nonprofit boards differently. And I hope that so many of you in this room consider having an experience on a nonprofit board. I think this, this model of profit nonprofit partnerships is extraordinarily important. I think it's going to get even more important as we can't depend on governments to solve huge problems that, you know, this really will be the model for so many of the world's biggest issues and having great, you know, business people on nonprofit boards is really important. They're mission-driven organizations, but they need to be held to the same standards. Whether it's standards of participation or understanding the business and um, I'm lucky enough to have uh, a couple of SAVE directors here, Charlotte's here, and I don't know whether Sue Decker's in the room, but, um, and actually more to come, we're bringing on at least two more directors that are at this meeting onto the SAVE the Children board, but we have about 32 directors, and we had a SAVE the Children board meeting, and we had 31 out of 32 directors attend our SAVE the Children board meeting, and that's because it's expected, they participate, and they contribute. We have a, I think we have to think about a new model for nonprofits boards in terms of how we hold them accountable for the incredibly important work they do. I mean, if there's reputation is almost even more important in that segment than it is any place else. So really understanding what they do and what those risks are, and I think risk management is incredibly important um, on a nonprofit board. So um, I hope that for many of you that aren't on boards and are anxious to have a board experience that you'll actually consider um, nonprofit boards. I'm sure, before I stop, that some of you are wondering, you know, how do, I, how do I make that break into getting on boards? 
and um, I was thinking about it um, in Warren's session and then when um, Denise and Maggie were talking as well. What could we all walk away with to kind of help um, really get some, you know, ignite, if you will, um, the candidates, the, the women candidates for boards. And here we sit in this talented group of women, right, that are participating in this meeting. So number one, this is a place where we should be networking and asking each other. Okay, some of us are running companies, some of us are in significant positions. We should be looking around, we should be looking for candidates. But I said to Carol, I think the one thing that I'm gonna walk away with is I'm gonna take this book and I'm actually gonna, Carol suggested this, put a sticky here that says, this is the candidate list for women directors. <laughs> and we're gonna share it. So, I seriously mean it. We ought to take this book and we ought to get it out there and say, you're looking for great directors, not great women directors, great directors. Here are a list of the most extraordinary women in business. Let's get it out there. Let's send it to all of our colleagues, male CEOs, companies that we are associated with. And let's kind of look at an approach of, let's get these names out there and, uh, and work this audience so that we can actually have as an outcome a lot more women in this room being considered for board. So I'm going to stop there and open it up. Well, Thank that you. was just wonderful. I am a minute. probably depends on the nature of the board or the nature of the CEO, but among best practices or worst practices is calling the CEO up not in, within the boardroom, but, but calling them up and, and talking to him about something you're worried about, an issue or something. Is that okay to do? Is it, do you do it all the time? All the time. All the time. Best practice. And I think, by the way, the best CEOs reach out. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't wait to be called. Um, right. I think, you know, I mean, the reality is, and it's, it's really a sobering reality, most boards meet six times a year. I mean, if that is the sum total of what you know about that company, sitting for something less than probably eight hours between committee meetings and board meetings, if that's what you know about the company, I think it's going to be real hard um, to really make a contribution and have an impact. I think we actually have to not just talk to the CEO, I think more importantly, we need to be reaching out to the people, the management team in the company. We need to be visiting factories. We need to be you know, understanding you know, the views of people below the CEO. Um, we need to be talking to their customers, understanding it from a customer perspective or a client perspective. So I think it's incumbent upon directors to stretch their reach in understanding what they know about the company and, you know, and quite frankly, you know, take the initiative even if that CEO is not picking up the phone and, um, and calling you. And um, I, I, every board I'm on, by the way, it's also a lot more enjoyable to feel engaged and knowledgeable about the company that you're working with. And, whether it's the Washington Post where you'll have dinner with you know, various people uh, outside of the CEO and have a chance to talk about the company, um, or you know, at J&J, &J, by the way, we're you know, rightfully visiting factories all over the world. We're going to Ch Shanghai for eight days next month, or this month, to really understand what's happening with the developing uh, business in China. I'm, I think it's a much bigger commitment than showing up at board meetings. Well, now let me call for questions from the audience, and uh, wait, we wait till the mic, right, here's one, uh, right here, pink, pink suit. <laughs> it's, it's not exactly pink. Uh, <laughs> and thank you very much for your comments, thanks, Carol. My name is Denise Cronin, I work for Siemens. Um, my question to you, and you're talking about the chemistry of a board, and I think it's the same thing for any team that has to be high performance, right? That yeah. you really focus on the chemistry, who do you think is responsible in creating that energy? If you say you join a board and you see that it's actually a dysfunctional right. board, is it the chairman's? Is it the CEO? Is it could it be two or three directors kind of banding together saying we need a happier place here? Because <laughs> this is you know this is putting the fun in dysfunctional. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah. 
kind of yeah. a, it isn't really a question, but how would yeah. you tackle that? You know, I think it is situational. I mean, where you have the luxury of a split chairman and CEO, I think the chairman of a board really can do the heavy lifting with regard to dealing with the dynamics on a board. And that, I mean, whether it's a lead director or chairman or whatever it is, um, you know, you need that person to have the chutzpah to take on, you know, the interaction issues on the board so that it's, it's a functioning board and you don't have, you know, people who are, you know, monopolizing boards or creating issues where there aren't issues or quite frankly being disrespectful to management, which I hate. I mean, I find that to be one of the worst characteristics of showing what a great director you are, that you can be disrespectful to management in the room. Um, so that's a luxury. I think it's harder when the CEO has to do it, um, but I've seen cases where that's unfortunately where it resides. I will say that I saw some of that on the Citigroup board, and um, I actually took the initiative to get together with some directors that I respected and said, unacceptable, I'm willing to make a statement about this in front of the full board. Um, and I'd like you know, some support um, to indicate that we want this board to be acting differently and engaging management in a constructive and respectful way. And, um, and we took it on and I think it made a difference. So I think the important thing is, is that we don't let it go. I think it's, it's poisonous when it just continues. It's demoralizing for board members that are uncomfortable with it. And I believe that you know, whatever position you're in, you've got the right to raise your hand and hold people accountable for behaving responsibly in the boardroom. Back there. Hi, Ann, Terry Kelly. A uh, question about how you uh, value the contribution. You mentioned how it's critical to board members. Have you seen some uh, creative ways of how they actually give the feedback back to the members of how they're actually contributing? You know, I think we've seen it lots of ways. I'm not a huge fee fan of kind of these formal feedback processes, I have to tell you. I think, you know, good boards know how to give feedback and how to encourage and engage participation. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of what we've seen with, um, you know, kind of board feedback and director feedback sometimes is more form than substance. So I'm kind of a big believer that, you know, on the spot, that, you know, this is where it's great to, if a director has a great idea and has made a great contribution, I mean, as a peer to say, fabulous idea, you know, thank you, and, and important for a CEO to say that as well, and let directors know when they're making a contribution. I mean, equally so when, you know, there's not so good contributions that aren't very helpful. Um, they're probably better done aside to begin with, but I do think they have to be shut down in some way. Um, Carol actually referred to, and this is actually more of a, a humorous story than a learning um, opportunity, but um, we did have a board member at Xerox at one point. I will not share um, his name. And, uh, you know, it wasn't working. It was really not good. And it was a complete disconnect on values. And it was offensive to me. I mean, you know, there's, you can disagree on strategy. There's a whole bunch of great things to disagree with, but don't mess with values. And, you know, you know we were coming through the biggest reputational crisis uh, in our history, and for someone who didn't appreciate. So I was very naive at the time and decided that I could have a conversation with that board member, just saying, not working out. <laughs> And, you know, maybe you'd be a better fit someplace else, but um, this isn't a good place for you. And I would really appreciate it, you know, if you kind of took your name out of consideration to be, continue your board service with Xerox. And um, so he quietly did, and then um, continued to trash me and Xerox in the marketplace for years after. <laughs> And it was a horrendous experience. And, you know, I think there were two lessons learned. One is that, um, you know, select your board very carefully and make sure you know what you're getting into. Um, and two, that's what the head of a nominating committee is for, <laughs> not the CEO. So I think there would have been a, a wiser approach to dealing with it. 
But I have to tell you, I, I think sometimes boards live with directors who should not be there. And there's got to be a way to not have this be um, you know, a legacy where board members you know, stick around for years if they're not making a contribution or they're not you know, a good fit for the board. There is another question right back the same table. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Anne. I know one of the hot topics right now in board governance is whether or not to separate the role of chairman and CEO. And I wonder if you might just talk based on your experience, you know, when you think which is appropriate and if there's any, you know, lessons learned there. Well, you know, I've, um, I've come a long way on this topic. Um, when I was CEO of Xerox and I was made chairman and CEO of Xerox, and I would have to say there wasn't a lot of competition for the job, so it wasn't a big debate at the company, but um, about a year after I was made chairman and CEO, um, Ralph Larson came to me, um, fabulous CEO, and said, you know, I thought a lot about it, and um, I think it would be great if we actually brought in an executive chairman for Xerox, because you know, you would get to focus on all the things that are so important to turning around this company, and, you know, we could have an executive chairman who really did a, he a lot of the heavy lifting on the board and could act as an interface. And I thought about it for two seconds and said, that would have been a really interesting discussion a year ago. <laughs> but, um, you know, you don't get to kind of reverse um, that. And I actually believe I would have been well served by having an executive chairman or a non-executive chairman at Xerox at that point in time. It might have made great sense um, for the right person to have played a role and um, you know had oversight of the company. Um, but I also think it's situational. You know, Xerox is kind of a um, you know integrated company. It's not a portfolio of companies. It's a very you know integrated culture. Um, you know, it's size-wise not, you know, a huge company. So I think the doability of doing a chairman and CEO role is there. I think in very complex portfolio companies, there's probably more of a rationale for it. So I think it's the makeup of the company. I think it's the profile of the CEO that needs to be taken into account. Um, and I think we need to stay away from these discussions of it's good, it's bad. I mean, I think it is situational, and this is one more example when we decide to be formulaic about something, we do a disservice to the way boards need to consider and think about what the leadership structure of the company should be. That is their job, and they should be able to make a decision that serves its constituencies best. So, you know, I'm just glad that we haven't gotten ourselves to a place that we started to legislate or you know, throw that out there as the single solution to leadership structures and companies. But I actually think you're going to see more of it, not less of it, because I do think it makes sense in lots of places and um, you know, it actually can be a real gift to a CEO who needs to be intensely focused on running the operations of the business. Yeah. Here. Oh, I'm sorry. Somebody else has a mic. Oh, okay. Yes. Back there. I'm sorry. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nancy Ossie, the International Medical Corps. We collaborate a lot. So yes, I know you. Thank you. <laughs> I was curious, um, having been in the not-for-profit sector for about 26 years, I'd love to get your perspective um, in the worlds that you live in about running a not-for-profit and being the CEO of a for-profit and the perception often that Running a not-for-profit is not as perhaps complex uh, or difficult as being a CEO in the private sector. I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Thank you. Well, I can kill that theory really quick. Uh, let me tell you, I, I mean, the complexity of the world of Save the Children trumps the complexity in many ways of Xerox every day of the week. Um, we operate in 120 countries. I mean, there is a humanitarian crisis right now in the Horn of Africa that is probably one of the biggest challenges we've seen in decades. And when you talk about rallying the expertise and the resources that are required to address you know, something like that, um, it's huge. The reputational risk is extraordinary. We just, I mean, we operate in places where, I mean, we've been thrown out of the Sudan, out of Darfur at times. We've, um, you know, we're, one of our biggest operations right now is in Pakistan, and that's not exactly a comfortable relationship. So, 
NGOs are in the middle of a very, very difficult situation with regard to the, the you know, political uh, climate um, in places like Pakistan. So, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't put complexity as one of the differences between the profit and the nonprofit world, um, but it is a different job. I mean, you know, this is, you've got to live the mission of these organizations. Um, we just put in our new CEO, uh, Carolyn Miles, Two for two on my watch, women. <laughs> but she's wonderful, and uh, but I mean, I mean, she slugs around the world, flying coach and visiting places um, that are really tough. I mean, you have to love what you do. You have to, I mean, you have to have that in your heart, and that has to be what drives you and motivates you every day of the week. Um, but you've got to be a great business person. Um, you have to have great leadership skills. Um, you have to be, I think, a fabulous risk manager um, to run a nonprofit these days. So, you know, I, I look at it as being a fairly um, robust skill set to run a nonprofit organization. I think the huge differentiator for me is, is that, you know, it really is a different mission, if you will, that you have to, you know, embrace um, in order to be successful in that sector. Back there? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Terry McClure at UPS. I was wondering, how do you feel about management <coughs> approaching the board, um, board members, individuals, on issues that they feel need to be disclosed to the board or the board members need to be aware of? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to that through the eyes of the CEO. And I'd like to think that you know, your first stop would be at least making sure that management understands your issues and, um, and that it ought to be um, an opportunity um, to have a dialogue with the CEO about whether or not it's a board issue or it's just a management issue or if it's something that the board should be aware of, um, how it's done. I think I wouldn't have a lot of time for a manager who went directly to the board, unless we're dealing with something like ethics or you know something that's obviously they didn't feel safe or whatever, um, working through management. So I'd like to think that our management structures work in ways that you know there'd be enough respect for a dialogue at the management level to decide how that best be presented if it really should be something that um, the board should see. Um, I think the reality is it probably wouldn't serve anyone well to go directly to the board, um, you know, if they hadn't kind of <coughs> edited it, at least with some portion of management. Maybe it's not even the CEO. I think, I, I, I think that's part of the responsibility of being a good member of a management team. If you wind up where there's zero reception, it's an important issue, you've run out of options, then I would definitely, a trusted board member is somebody that, you know, I think could be a resource for you, but I think you ought to <coughs> test your options before you get there. We have time for about two more short questions. Uh, oh, how about over here? Oh, you've got one, you've got one there? Okay, we'll come back to you. Okay. Hi, Heidi Sinclair with Robert Shanwin. Uh, we've talked about public boards and about nonprofit boards, but I have, um, over the last couple of years, gotten onto some private company boards. And in my experience, um, what I've discovered is that these CEOs are desperate for our experience. Generally, the boards are loaded with their venture capitalists and, the, yeah. and, and lawyers, and that's great, but they need operating talent, yeah. and people who can sit down and go through their strategy and help them make decisions. And it's just been a lovely experience for me, so yeah. it was very tough. So I would encourage the people to look I think the that's, private sector. I think that's a great um, statement, great opportunity. And you know, at their best, I mean, boards should act like good boards, whether they're part of a private or a public company. And uh, you need the same set of skills and capabilities. Great comment. Actually, I, want, I want to build on that comment. I, ha I have the privilege of serving on uh, three major corporate boards, uh, FedEx, Caterpillar, and Boeing. Um, but I want to go to the point where, if you look at major corporate boards, the tipping point seems to be the third woman board member. There are many, many boards that have two women. Yeah. The third one. Yeah. I happen to be on the boards. So they were looking for international trade, government experience. Right. Having a list of women 
in alphabetical order isn't going to get them yeah. the third one. Right. How do you get boards to look at women when they're looking for the finance expertise, the technology expertise? It's okay, the sitting CEO, that's fine. You, you know, they always, they always go to women sitting CEOs. You have this never-ending list of, of um, you know, corporate execs approaching you, right? So how do we get the broad, you know, how do we broaden the base so that these corporations identify women, whether it's first, second, third echelon, to get to the third, that tipping point where you've got the third woman board member, because then you can pretty much guarantee you will get to that 25, yeah. you know, quarter, third, and so on. Well, and I'm sure some of you have great ideas there, but um, I would say that's where um, those two women sitting on the board have some accountability. I wish it wasn't that way, and hopefully there's more. Um, but, you know, I, I think sometimes we just need to be a little bit more ambitious about ensuring that we're putting candidates on the table to get that next wo woman on a board, that if we go passive, um, then you're right. Maybe that next candidate, you know, won't be a woman. Um, there's some interesting research from Catalyst. Is I mean here? Yeah, um, that companies run by women, women CEOs, have more women directors, percentage of women directors than company run by men. Correct? No? Well, they should. <laughs> no, uh, um, unfortunately, there just aren't enough companies run by women to have a statistical significance to show that, um, you know, that yes. that comparison is true. Anecdotally, it looks that way, yeah, but okay. you kind of can't do the statistical from it. Yes. What we did do uh, research on that um, shows the impact of three or more women on the board, so I think yes. back to that point about three, um, is first of all, if there are three or more women on the board, uh, the correlation with financial performance is significantly higher. Um, and the other one that we did is that if there are three or more women on the board, and this is cause and effect, uh, not correlation, but five years later, there are more women in senior leadership, and in particular, in operating roles. Yeah. So that P&L role, the general manager, or whatever. That, uh, and, and I've talked to women on boards where there are three or more, and they say, but we never talk about this in the meeting. It's not talking about it necessarily once there are three or more. It's that the, the whole consideration of who is talented when executives and other succession planning is going on. It just takes on a different complexion and a different tone. And so. it's true, wherever women are, critical mass really does make the difference. And I don't think we should blindly send the book out. I actually think we should tag five or six women that we know that are great and say you ought to be considering these particular women because they're fabulous, so not the generic, but the specific, um, because I do think that we have this opportunity to be advocates and help change the pace of the progress for women directors, and um, I think that can be done. Well, I'm afraid that has to be the end of it. Um, uh, Anne, it was terrific. <laughs>